prepared this session. Thank you for coming and enjoy the conference. Okay. Now should, should I do something so I appear large on the screen? <laughs> yeah. I'll just talk, I'm the little head. Uh, good afternoon, good morning for those of us in the States. It's, I'm Vince Marchetti, it's my pleasure to serve as host or chair of this session. We'll be hearing presentations and discussing four papers that all seem that all have the theme of improving the quality of our virtual experience. And as you we all know, uh, across the globe, we've in the last two years or so, we've had a been forced to address our dreams of doing things remotely and virtually because all of a sudden we had to. Uh, so we have a paper on assessing the quality of virtual experience for education at the college level in some courses in agriculture. Our second paper is developing methods to evaluate how different browsers or different rendering environments might uh, visualize the same underlying model and figuring out ways that we can do some quality control so every user gets the, the comparable experience uh, and that content authors can be confident that their content will be visible in a certain way. We have a paper on improving latency by, they have developed some algorithms for loading assets in a way which improves the virtual experience. And uh, then also some recent developments in extending the X3D standard uh, to give access to better audio, I guess the audio visualization or, or rendering of, of audio uh, in a 3D virtual environment. Our first paper is, uh, I believe the presenter and the pre-recorded session of doc is Dr. Nicholas Paulus. The title of the paper is X3D Field Trips for Remote Learning. And it's very interesting, but the one sentence from the paper that jumped out at me was the operator hid behind trees. So I hope that either in the remote session, Nicholas explains that, um, or we can discuss it in the question and answer. So if we can start the recording, please. Hello, Web3D. <laughs> Welcome, my name is Nicholas Paulus. I'm happy to have you here in the Visionarium Lab at Virginia Tech to present our paper called X3D Field Trips for Remote Learning. So we're really excited and obviously um, thrilled about Web3D technologies can last. And if you speak web, we're ready for you. We can integrate and consume all that great data and services that are out there published in the standard web stack. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, I want to do a quick, um, very quick review of the learning applications that we've been inspired by and that we've worked on in Web3D over the years. Then talk about the disciplines and the domains uh, that we worked with for this paper and the scope of this paper and the kind of lessons that they connect to in terms of their pedagogical purpose and the reason why uh, we're able to use Web3D technologies in the educational setting, undergraduates, professionals, graduates, for example. Uh, along the way, we've seen all kinds of design challenges. That's really what this paper is about, how we uh, address them and the kinds of feedback that we received. There's obviously a lot of potential and great work to do. So let's see where we can go on our field trips here. Well, virtual experiences and learning have been going on a long time. We started to see some real momentum build in the natural sciences and geography and hydrology, for example, uh, as more and more of our colleagues, you know, became equipped with these nice capture platforms, uh, 360 degree uh, cameras, LIDAR, drones, etc. And we started to publish that and put those into, again, educational contexts for the students um, at Virginia Tech. We also know that it's supposed to be fun and with open-ended uh, agency, 
you know, users can really engage uh, with their field trips and the place that they're going to, even if it's virtual. 3D is a great platform to help make sure that we have common reference points and grounding, right? So if we're talking about uh, a new building in civil engineering, um, being able to look at the scale and walk through it from all kinds of perspectives, again, is, a, is really powerful. And we've used immersive and web 3D design for, for some award-winning sorts of projects that you can see there on the wing. It has a, a video link. So we know that there's no substitute for going to on the field trip, right? We all want to we all want to go there for real, but there's a lot of reasons sometimes that we can't for time or money. And so virtual experiences can provide, you know, reasonable, compelling surrogates for that physical uh, field trip. But even if you are able to go, you know, your time might be limited. So you want to make sure that you spend your time on site most efficiently right so in a certain way also these virtual field trips can prime us for spending our time more wisely when we're uh, when we are do actually get to the location it's super important right in all of these examples and all the other ones in the literature that it's a real partnership and a design dialogue where you're talking with the instructor talking about the standards of learning that it has to connect to the concept inventory, right? What sort of activities they might do in the traditional educational setting, and then how can we translate those into a virtual setting? So we kind of collected in this paper a, a series of research projects as we're trying to understand the usability and deployment of these on a land grant scale, a mission that includes uh, graduates, undergraduates, professionals, uh, coming to Virginia Tech uh, to learn about land management practices and, and all sorts of things, as we'll see, including uh, environment uh, design. So a little breakdown there. And as we go through these, I'm just going to point out the main lessons. And of course, you've read the paper. But in any of these places that we want to go, right, we can often count on a few common elements, right? And we know we're going to have a map of a place Maybe we have some, some local data like a, uh, you know, a sensor that was in the stream for the last 10 years and we want to go, go and look at that sensor data. Um, we might have 3D objects like a bridge or a sculpture or a shrub right, that are set in a location and have uh, potency in terms of the, the pedagogical value. right? We want to portray them. We want to show them in and use them as, as lessons. So 3D objects, and then now we have, um, you know, cameras uh, that are capturing 3D spherical video and imagery. And this gives you a photorealistic sense of place, right? So what we want to talk about uh, mostly in this paper is sort of the three kind of flavors of challenges that we encountered. And, and these are probably going to apply to any future sorts of virtual field trips that you might take on the web, immersive or desktop or, or by phone. First one is, how do we put the stuff together, the scene composition? I mean, times we're processing different data sources. We've got to merge them, uh, register them, etc. So there's a few sort of technical and engineering challenges there. The second thing is the 3D user interface. And this is an interaction design kind of challenge where depending on the activity and the pedagogical purpose, you might want to um, change a navigation mode, right, for example. And this becomes a, a problem of in interaction design. And as these virtual field trips become richer and you start to build more data into them, sensors or uh, you know, tables and other kinds of data, you're trying to think about how you lay that out on the screen or in the immersive environment. This is information rich kind of layouts. So the three flavors of our design challenges. All right, well, we get equirectangular projections from a lot of these cameras. They come in now you know, more and more resolution. And here, actually, you can see uh, behind me an example 
of one of our captures uh, over at Struble's Creek on our stream lab. And we're just uh, downstream from campus and where we have several monitoring bridges set up. And we have a whole number of interesting things that you might want to see if you come to Struble's Creek, right? We have the sampling bridges. Maybe we've scanned those with a terrestrial or a drone based or a handheld kind of LIDAR. So we've got objects in places and we want to um, show them in context. So we're trying to integrate these field trips obviously with more of an overview and a survey kind of knowledge of the place, okay? Um, we've got viewpoints in every photosphere, but if you go inside of photosphere and you're used to 3D graphics, you'll probably notice that uh, you know, your text comes out uh, rendering uh, backwards. Right? So we know we have to flip these uh, equirectangulars. Here's just a quick example of kind of what I'm talking about, right? We've got locations here on a map where we've gone out to the field, we've captured photospheres and 3D objects. 3D objects including Professor Monsell here, who's sampling the ramps patch with his plant shoe application entering GPS and natural observation data. Ramps are delicious, by the way. They're a relative of the onion family that we enjoy very much in the springtime here in Appalachia. So we've been able to con contextualize now this activity in the place at McDaniel's Nut Grove, for example. Now we've been able to bring together over the years, like on based on this idea, uh, a lot of different kinds of content and for different purposes. So I'm just going to show quickly uh, a few of these virtual site visits that we've done. So one of them is with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, long trail, uh, limited amount of time, but they're talking about surveying from view sheds of the Appalachian Trail, natural, cultural sites of historic significance, trying to understand what parts of the landscape to preserve if you're walking along the trail. So we can take them to a virtual all the sites along the trail in an afternoon. And uh, that's a lot easier than than hoofing up the backpack and, and the boots. We've also used it in graduate education design activities. Okay, I'll talk about um, the uh, project where we had graduate students designing with USDA uh, software, image software, they're uh, planting recommendations for specific sites, and they were able to design, share, and then present those designs um, through a virtual field trip. And then finally, uh, we hosted an agroforestry conference here in Blacksburg, and I'll share with you um, a few images and examples of, you know, how we were able to take the attendees to the conference, which was before COVID and, and here physically in Blacksburg, uh, take them to many sites in a half a day um, and thus, you know, give them extra experiences and also prime them for the sites that they were going to see in real life. Okay, so here's a little picture of the uh, Appalachian Trail Conservancy crew here in the Visionarium. There we're looking at it in stereo in this case. And they're looking across the valley at where the trail is going on the way to Angel's Rest, which is an iconic uh, location uh, right outside of Blacksburg, just a little northwest. Here's an image. This is also in a video from the lab in Vimeo if you want to watch it, but Professor Munsell and his students, and you can see in the background, they've actually planted a whole series of different species in various locations on a certain hillside. Um, based on the, the spherical imagery that they acquired in the field. Here's a, another example. This is from the, the conference tutorial. And um, actually, I can bring this up, I think, if I hit that and then I hit this. We'll load up the example here with. <clears throat> that we use in the forest farming, right? We've got several sites we want to visit right back there. Some of them are talking about golden seal, some about ginseng, some about black cohosh, some are hardwoods, some are mixed woods. And basically we just want to browse the environment. Uh, 
right? By hopping around different viewpoints. And we're gonna always make sure that we go outside the sphere and then back into one. So here we are uh, in one of those examples. And I might be pointing out to you some things about the slope and the density of the planting. Maybe it's something about the canopy or the, uh, the ground forest floor, what kind of soil is here, right? And maybe we wanna to go to the next location and I'll just hop to the next viewpoint, right? And on a desktop, this would just be page up and page down, right? Okay. So being able to take our conference attendees to several places would have taken two days to drive to the mall, but in an afternoon, we're able to uh, scaffold and create lessons about all of these special locations and their, the considerations for management. And here's a, just a picture of an attendee in the exhibit hall at the conference uh, going to the ramps patch with Dr. Munsell. This was actually the ramps patches in New York. It's probably 10 hours away from the location. Okay. So we had a, a, some initial successes, some real compelling experiences that were focused, right, on different disciplines and on specific uh, pedagogical purposes. Right? So the next kind of design challenge that we had to come across was about the 3D user interface, right? So I'm here in an immersive cave. I've got all kinds of 27 million pixels around me to project and look around. I can use six degree of freedom navigation, right, with my uh, wand device. And that seems pretty natural, but if I'm on a desktop or um, on a phone, right, I might have to experience the same content, but just with a different, in a different way. So I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges we face just based on the, the standard kind of, the standard X3D deployment, okay. So we worked with uh, Katie Meany, she's uh, one of our co-authors here and a professor in the School of Visual Arts. And one of her undergraduate uh, classes and one of her specialties is environment and exhibit design, right? So you think about public sculptures, you think about museums, how does the content, the user, the context all communicate, right? To make, a, to make an experience. And so she was really interested in the Bauhaus movement and Herbert Beyer's uh, sculpture called the Chromatic Gate. And so for one of her projects uh, with her students, one of the units in the class um, talking about environment and context was to take the Chromatic Gate and put it in different places. So in different contexts and locations. And we were able to do that with a virtual field trip and, and of course easily with X3D. But some of the things that we came across, right, were that uh, if you're putting the photosphere around the object, where's the ground, right? It's a sphere. So essentially we had to create an invisible floor in order for our walk mode to function as expected. And you can see this in the, in the video and also in the web version invisible floor, the viewpoint starts at the center of the sphere, 1.6 meters or whatever your avatar size is, and you explore and navigate the environment uh, in walking. So I'm just gonna step away for a second and load that up here. Let's... Okay. So yeah, so here we are at the, at the Bauhaus School, and this, this image is copyright Dirk Blundell. But you can tell what we're doing, we've, we've put our avatar, our virtual camera, right, on the ground, so now I can walk, and I can literally walk through the chromatic gate. Let's see if I can get in there from, <laughs> from behind. Right, but now I'm observing, I'm experiencing this sculpture at real life scale. And it also has its context, 
and we can take this to Mars, we can take it to the beach, we can take it all kinds of places. It's actually um, installed in on the West Coast in California somewhere, you can go visit it. Herbert Byers chromatic gate. So one of the design challenges around 3D user interfaces was, yeah, navigation and trying to make sure that the user saw and experienced the world from as a walker from ground level as they would as a human. Okay, so navigation mode, a little bit more about that. Fly is awkward, we can tilt and roll, it doesn't quite seem right when you're inside the sphere, outside the sphere. Walk works more like we expect it to, like you're on the ground level, you're looking around, you're on an invisible floor. Uh, and, you know, the typical, the default in X3D, the examine mode, is kind of the opposite of what we want, because really what we just want to do is sort of pivot our head from the inside out, rather from the outside in, which is what examine does. So we looked at the turntable mode, um, which is an experimental mode in X-Freedom. It's not in the spec, um, but it does have some nice features, right? There's no roll, um, and it's in the, the web browser. So if we um we sort of dug into this we started to think about okay well you know, everything these remote field trips work pretty well if you're using certain kinds of metaphors to map your six degrees of freedom of your camera control well on a desktop you know it was uh that the default implementation kind of moved the camera in the direction that you were dragging right so it's sort of like camera centric uh, but the instructors and the folks who are going to deliver this sort of realized that, uh, well, sort of said, hey, you know, is that right? It doesn't feel quite right to me. And they uh, were working on the metaphor more of like a, you know, a touch screen where I might have the, the photosphere here. And when I drag, I'm actually dragging the sphere, right? Not the camera. I'm not moving the camera. So that was the main difference, right? We just basically had to reverse the, the drag vector. And so we thought that oh, that's a good idea. You know, let's, uh, let's try it. We piloted it out with a bunch of the stakeholders and uh, it was overwhelming that they preferred the drag metaphor to work inside the photospheres. And so that's what we deployed with the class. All right, the national, uh, the USDA issues certificates for our uh, silviculture and forest uh, management programs. Uh, these are people from USDA or BLM or Indigenous Nations. Uh, every year we graduate a cohort of 30 of these people who are now trained and can make decisions about how we manage our forest land, right? So there's going to come up with a variety of challenges in their career, different regions, different kinds of species, Right, and so the certification uh, is meant to kind of give them the tools, theoretical and otherwise, uh, for best management practices, land management. And uh, so we decided to build, uh, when COVID came, we said, we've got to pivot, still need these people in the field, let's get the certification done with virtual field trips. Okay, and this is an opportunity. So we know we have these places, they're all well measured, uh, we send out, um, Dr. Munsell and we enlist his, uh, his students and his, his colleagues, his team, uh, to annotate these uh, trees in, with property ends that are all basically displayed in different layouts uh, with HTML, right? Divs and Z orders and so on. So we're seeing overview of a map, we're seeing the photosphere of our location, we're seeing details of each uh, forest plot. So here's kind of like what that overview looks like, right? It's kind of pretty much the same that I've got on the phone, right? And if you go to that URL, we've used the inverted turntable, the pull and drag metaphor uh, in, in, in these environments. And then if you, you know, you can pull out different, uh, maximize different kinds of information displays about those trees, right? For example, their size, their species, age, things like that, where they live in the overall site in terms of um, this plot. So as you're designing a, 
uh, land management program for this site, you're thinking about all these different plots and you're thinking about all these different trees and you're trying to make a, a good recommendation. So as you can see, you know, a lot of design challenges and obviously logistical too, but once we can put a URL up, a URL is the place that you go for this field trip, right? It's another address. Uh, it's just a virtual one. So the art students gave us a lot of um, qualitative feedback, probably the most, uh, we would categorize them into a couple themes, right? Uh, affinity analysis. Um, most of them were really, changed their sense of scale in their discussion when they're talking about a sculpture environment you know looking at a static picture is very different from having intentionality to explore and look at different from the objects from different viewpoints right um, and understand it in relation to uh, yourself your scale uh, they were excited about the novelty of you know having classwork that was in vr and and that was neat, but that agency the, the, that they could do this virtual field trip kind of go off on their own to do certain things was was really valuable to them. So those are a couple of things that showed up in the uh, School of Visual Arts class where we deployed these virtual field trips. COVID came, uh, we were we did the NASP certification program with professional foresters, right? So these are people who are uh, already working for the USDA or BLM or the Indigenous Nations managing lands. And usually they take a week and a half, two weeks, they travel to a location, you know, they're focused in on these activities. It's an intensive uh, program, right? Short burst of, of education. But with COVID, there was a number of challenges, you know, uh, people are still at home, they still have to deal with their kids and the boss and all this sort of stuff. And they've been online all day already. So there were a few challenges, but uh, you know, overall we saw uh, 89, 90% of the respondents really saying like, this was valuable. This was a worthwhile surrogate experience on my virtual field trip. You know, even if they had come to Blacksburg for this training, they wouldn't have been able to visit the North Woods of Maine, right? A Southern Georgia, um, you know, pine stand. Uh, northwestern rainforest, right? So they actually got a really well-rounded um, experience, sort of despite uh, maybe the uh, the fidelity and detail that they might be uh, missing. And indeed, some of those subjective comments, a few of our um, really astute, I think, uh, students, you know, noted some things that we're going to have to work on, which is um, that you know hopping around and teleporting to these different spheres kind of makes it a really difficult to integrate kind of the full space in some sort of survey knowledge some overview right so these are the things we're going to work on next uh, we want to keep on that usability uh, improvement iterative and uh, progressive and of course we're going to be offering these classes on into the future so uh, we've thought about some different ways of creating better spatial context and spatialization of the information. So having maybe not just one sphere at the middle of the plot, but also looking into the plot from the four cardinal directions. So you actually have five spheres per plot. Um, understanding how those plots relate. So maybe instead of, you know, an overview map, we really do get the LIDAR from the location and you can see the slopes and the angles and some elevation in there as you're moving between the, the locations, the, the plots. And um, the other thing, uh, again, about sort of information rich integration, we know we can do this better. We make it easier so that if I know that tree 13 is on screen in my photosphere, oh, wait, where is that over here? All right. Oh, yeah. Well, now the data in the table for number 13 shows up at the top. So we could coordinate some kind of sorting uh, of the data table based on what the user is looking at. That's, I think, would be a valuable feature going forward. So thank you uh, for your attention today. I want to welcome everyone to drop us a line, take us on a field trip to your place, uh, or if you want to collaborate on 
uh, more kinds of research in this area, how to make these experiences more effective, authentic, usable. Um, we know that it's not just about virtual environments and virtual characters. We need disciplinary experts and the instructors are what make the field trip, right? Your docent explaining to you real time what you're seeing. This, uh, this matters and it's, uh, it helps with retention and, and all sorts of things. We think that uh, this could scale up a lot more, right? These 360 cameras are out there. Um, so maybe if we work as a community to establish some templates and maybe some simple services, uh, we'll be able to all um, visit each other a little more readily, even in the, the times of COVID. The web is wide and I uh, look forward to, to visiting your part of it. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions now. Okay, Nicholas, thank you. And I, I wanna remind people that uh, you can ask questions on either the Zoom chat or the Hoover chat. And I know that Nicholas looks like he has been uh, answering some questions. I also am cognizant that uh, we started a few minutes late and we certainly wanna hear all the other presentations. Uh, so Nicholas, I know I, from the chat, you've been discussing some of the other sensory inputs uh, so let me ask if you can briefly sort of uh, address that issue. Uh, the issue was brought up of sound, and that might be important because in a, f in a little while we'll be hearing about sound rendering. So Nicholas, sound, smell, and touch. Yeah, thanks. These are certainly um, create a more uh, immersive or, or possibly a compelling experience. Um, in our uh, case, right, the, uh, the cow cattle fields are right down the hill, so that might not be a very pleasant smell. Um, but uh, yeah, these things do impact uh, presence, and um, as certainly audio would be the easiest uh, one, and being able to have, again, sort of spatial sense of if there's a highway right in a certain direction, that uh, that's reflected also in the uh, in the rendering of the sound. So I think it's got a lot of potential. Um, as we say, you know, I think one of the best parts of this is that it sort of translates into someone's home, right? It doesn't need this this cave uh, to go on the trip, and so and we can see what um, kind of consumer devices emerge uh, as well in the next few years. Thanks for that question. Okay. And uh, I remind people that this, this Whova application we're using allows you to continue these chats and conversations uh, as well. So perhaps it's appropriate to advance to the next paper. The title is X3D and GLTF Model Differencing for Conversions, Comparison, and Conformance Testing. And so I'll, I'll ask if we can start that uh, recording. Hi. Welcome to our paper on X3D and GLTF model differencing for conversions, comparison, and conformance testing. X3D4 now includes full capabilities for GLTF 2.0 compatibility, providing physically based rendering and lighting techniques. We want to ensure that X3D4 players match exactly to each other and GLTF reference images in every single use case now and in the future. The main point of our paper is to walk through different differencing methods that are useful and helping find out why models look different. There are several different types of differencing techniques that we use. The first is plain text differencing. It allows us to find the differences between two models that are represented by just plain text documents. The second is structured text differencing, such as the differencing between two XML documents. 2D rendering differences is most familiar to most people where we compare rendered images 
and use differencing techniques on them. There's conversion differencing where we look at the same model that's been rendered with a GLTF render and a converted into an X3D rendered model and do a comparison that way. And that's been very useful for our, helping us identify uh, issues in specifications and conformance. 3D differencing looks at how a model's structure may change over time, whether that's the mesh uh, through some reduction or compression techniques that may alter the underlying structure. And uh, another type of differencing is in animation where certain keyframes are selected and then we choose the 2D differencing uh, techniques. So canonicalization is important because uh, in plain text documents and even some of the uh, in some of the structured formats, there's not always a uh, consistent ordering between data elements or representation of those data elements. So getting those uh, you know, same peer level uh, sets of information ordered in a way that's consistent helps us do differencing comparisons. So structured text differencing is quite mature. Many folks uh, who write application code use this all the time to understand where there are insertions or deletions and how um, a particular code base or structure changes over time and so we've adopted this to do comparison for the structured types of documents mainly XML based documents and uh, this simple visual illustration uh, shows uh, a change in a line, deletion and insertion, uh, using a color scheme, it makes it very apparent uh, where a certain change occurred and if that change caused a difference uh, in the object models then we're able to find out where and ultimately what and why it changed. So in 2D di rendering differencing we can look at sets of things like a particular reflection mode uh, of a surface property and see how uh, those uh, changes to an implementation, a rendering implementation, uh, may cause differencing over time in a set of features. So this multi-textured teapot example is a useful example that uh, we use to find um, where there were additional additions needed to the X3D specification and uh, it, was, it was helpful for that for us. One thing that we found very helpful is the GLTF 2.0 samples and we scripted the automation uh, of the conversion of those to X3D and then we also scripted the rendering of those models uh, for generating comparison images. So the example you see is one in particular that is pretty common in uh, helping shake out where there are differences in the specification or where there are differences in the implementation of the specification. And this sort of use case is the latter and it makes it apparent when maybe a certain feature isn't implemented yet in a particular uh, X3D render. Another type of differencing we found to be helpful is looking at the actual changes to the 3D shape over time. Uh, this 3D differencing is useful in showing where there were changes in volume, both insertions or deletions to a particular model. The other type of differencing is video differencing or animation differencing where we have multiple keyframes within a sequence and each has maybe a different model state, a lighting state, uh, changes in camera position and orientation and we perform in essence a 2D comparison at those individual renderings uh, for each individual frame 
or uh, a subset of the individual frames uh, within a given sequence. We come to a common theme in going through this differencing work. And the common theme is that these tests are repeatable. They are, they can help ensure consistency. Uh, they're almost, they're contained in a way that's uh, very similar to unit testing perspective. And we felt that if we share these uh, tests in GLTF sample models and scripts uh, out there that we can help improve the testability and help address the problem of uh, uh, consistency uh, between the renders and the viewers. So the major conclusions of our work are that yes we have found these differencing methods uh, and yes they've helped us shake out uh, a common recurring set of reasons why. Um, so the first is yay we're able to uh, test GLTF 2.0 and X3D 4.0 and able to make those representations um, with a subset of models, the GLTF 2.0 sample models. Um, uh, and then we know that most of the differences are caused by um, not having defaults in, in a particular scene or differences in default lighting settings and things like that. They're not necessarily uh, conversion errors, although we did find and update the X3D specification so it has been quite helpful. So there are a number of uh, areas that we came across uh, for further work. The first is in the viewers and converters area. Uh, there are some issues with correctness that we identified that uh, could be worked on and improved. Uh, the implementation of the spec, just various features that need to be built out. Um, and then looking at sort of the spec itself in terms of color mode and uh, making sure things uh, are kind of fully correct there. On the efficiency side, uh, there's work that's needed for binary encoding as well as uh, tools and implementations to, to bring about a more efficient representation, a binary representation of the models. Well, we're happy to help and to join the party, the party to make Web 3D graphics better. Uh, we want to say thank you to the folks who have built a GLTF 2.0 samples repository. Uh, that repository is very detailed and covering uh, many of the specification topics that are useful when doing differencing testing. Uh, we feel that we can add more open test examples that will be uh, even better. Uh, we think it's helpful to continue to convert GLTF to X3D, uh, not only for differencing comparison, but uh, for generating samples as well. Um, we feel we can be a good partner in a continued dialogue to share the best ways to convert a GLTF to X3D. And we hope that we can liaison and work to uh, match capabilities and learn from each other. We're very thankful that the Web 3D Consortium and the Kronos organization have entered into a formal agreement to ensure that compatibility and correctness continue for these complementary standards. We'd also like to mention that None of this work would be possible without the deep technical expertise and sustained efforts of Michaelis Camborellis. We're very grateful for his continuing work with both X3D and GLTF. We are continuing to work on this effort. Please send us bug reports. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Rick. Um, I'm looking to see. Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll ask. Uh, perhaps Marco can uh, 
promote Dr. Brutzman to being a panelist. Uh, but Rick is also uh, able to answer questions. Uh, I invite the attendees to ask questions through the chat. Uh, Rick, let me start with a question. I don't, I don't want to make it too broad, but when you do this comparison, are you strictly operating at, this, at the sense of the entire scene? And what I'm thinking about is effects where, if we remember the blue dress, gold dress controversy from a few years ago, where the appearance of things sometimes depends on the context in which they appear. Is this a factor in, in the kind of differencing that you, you studied? Uh, the samples, if you guys can hear me okay, sir, the samples are uh, typically more granular than that. There normally is a default scene uh, setting that, that takes place in terms of the initial viewpoint uh, and lighting, uh, things like that. Um, but uh, it, for the most part, the, for the current samples, there, there's just single viewpoint that's consistent between the formats and the ultimate end rendered state, at least for the, the 2D comparison. And in terms of geometry and, and text-based comparison, uh, those things can operate down at the individual object level, sort of irrespective of orientation. Sure. OK. Yeah, and uh, uh, that's correct. And, and Vince, uh, uh, in support of your question, I think we're fortunate in that the uh, GLTF folks have uh, generated what they call reference images and uh, corresponding to the models. So we are specifically not trying to uh, do with every uh, interaction or unforeseen possibility, but rather strictly focused on, well, if this is what it says, what does it look like? And uh, we ask that question twice. We say, if this is what the GLTF model is, what does it look like when the extra D player loads the GLTF model? And then we ask it again to say, if this is what the GLTF model is and we convert it into extra D4 nodes, matching uh, the correspondences that Michaelis Cambarellis has done, then does it look the same? So, so it's it's all about quality assurance. It's about consistency. It's about can the rendering look the same when we mix and match X3D so that with GLTF so that we can say yes, we have good representations. And um, frankly, I think every time we come up with edge cases like maybe the ones uh, one you mentioned. Oh, we're learning something. We're learning something. Yeah. Do we have all of the default parameters set? Is there something that's been overlooked? Is there something in our native rendering that is not matched to our extra D adaptation of that same rendering? Okay. So I, I'm looking to see because. Uh, if there are any other comments or questions, we do have a, a little bit of time for an additional discussion. Uh, I don't see anybody's hand up. So let me continue. Rick, you mentioned that you attribute the, the differences at, at some level, you attribute that to lighting. Uh, as a little bit of an insider, I know that, and you mentioned Michaela spent a lot of time understanding the, the equations of physically based rendering. Uh, th does your work indicate that similar work has to be done to have compatible lighting across these? Well, we're talking about two standards, X3D or GLTF. Is lighting a, the next challenge for this work? I, honestly, I'm not sure. I, I'm sure it's <laughs> definitely challenging. Um, <laughs> But in terms of the specifics of each implementation, that you know, this sort of work will kind of point in a direction of maybe where the problem is, and then obviously there's a there's a much deeper type of analysis that that happens and uh, to kind of work out those consistency issues. So, 
um, having the scripted, having it repeatable, you know, so that if you're doing an implementation or doing a change and um, you commit that and want to just make sure that everything uh, is still working or that you didn't throw up any red flags uh, in, in the you know, commit and things like that, this this will be helpful. But uh, you're right, there's there's a far deeper body of work that's happening regarding uh, you know, the math and data implementations. Yeah, that's that's right. And um, I, I must say, um, Vince, I shared your uh, concern about whether lighting is a big issue or not. And um, uh, oh, look, there's lighting. <laughs> uh, because uh, I think as 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 we were first looking at the GLTF examples, they didn't always have lights defined, or they uh, <clears throat> look different. There's, there are some pretty infamous sl slides over the years where you would see nine different Anakin Skywalker helmets. And, you know, the moral of the slide would be, oh, look, uh, everybody can do GLTF. Then you look at the images and no two are alike. And, you know, so what's that about? Well, uh, I suspect that uh, the root cause there might have been uh, maybe not lighting differences, but rather no lights defined in the scene and people were doing their own lights and of course that greatly changes what what things look like so so as we go go through the examples and we've only done you know 12 maybe out of uh, 75 current examples up there as we go through and compare the original gltf with the loading of it as we go and compare the original GLTF with the conversion and then the um, uh, rendering in native X3D nodes, we should see the same thing. If we don't, it's lighting as good cause, uh, probable cause. Uh, another uh, secondary quite related is whether lights have all of their default parameters uh, defined. and. Uh, um, we are finding now that just about everything does have default parameters defined. So it, consistency appears to be possible is the short answer. And working through every example diligently, putting it online, making it available for X3D players to do the right thing yep. will let us really put our fingers on what is the right thing. Is the example a good definition of the GLTF spec? Is the X3D mapping of that a good correspondence or have we overlooked something? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I, I think it, it, we should soon move on to the next paper. Uh, Don, I will refer you to the message from, from Carol. Uh, her group with IEEE is very interested in, in uh, things like such as fabrics and and you know, more organic materials and which is another challenge. But let's move on to the third paper of our session, the visibility aware web-based virtual reality. And I believe that uh, Carter Slocum is, is presenting and is available to answer questions. So we can proceed, Hi, thank you. 3D. Welcome to the presentation on VIA, visibility aware web-based virtual reality. I'm Carter Slocum and I'll be giving the presentation. I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of California, Riverside, and I worked on this paper with Jingwen Huang, the second year undergrad, and Professor Jesse Chen, both of our advisors. So to overview the presentation, we're going to quickly cover some background information in order to understand VIA. Then we will go into the main problem that VIA solves, the causes, and how we came about the solutions. We will then do a quick demo of VIA in action, and then we will go into the experiments we ran in order to evaluate VIA and those results quickly finish with a Q&A session. So to start with the background, uh, VIA came about as an idea when poking around the uh, WebXR framework. This is where we get the web-based virtual reality component of the presentation. WebXR is a framework built on top of Web3D, which is designed to enable uh, VR and AR on the web. WebXR uses a technology known as the GLTF format in order to transfer the graphics information over the web. The GLTF is a JSON-like file object which contains metadata about 
the geometry and the textures of a scene. The geometry is typically stored in a .bin file along with other information like animation. And the textures are mostly stored in really common image formats like PNG and JPEG. So the main problem that we encountered when working with WebXR is incredibly long loading times on mobile devices like phones or headsets. Uh, these loading times could take anywhere from 30 seconds to multiple minutes on incredibly slow networks. Uh, the download sequence of these objects is similar to how you would request images and JavaScript and text on a normal web browser, but in this case it's more complicated, much larger, because they are full 3D scenes. Uh, the main causes that we could find for this problem are the first being that all the geometry and animation data are stored in one large .binary file. In some cases this binary file can be larger than all other files requested by the website. Uh, and this must be downloaded before any objects can be rendered in the headset or on the web browser. Typically just one of these and many image files. The image files can be bigger than the binary, but in some cases the binary is so monolithic it dwarfs them. The second cause that we could find is the fact that all of these images are requested in arbitrary order, typically whatever order is decided by the uh, 3D modeling software that generates the GLTF in the first place. So for example here we have a user who's standing on a balcony of a shack looking at a satellite dish on top of a mobile home next to them. The roof above the shack, which is not visible to the user, is requested about sixth over all of the 50 objects that could be requested, and the satellite dish's texture is not requested until about the 47th. So the user is staring at an incorrect image for an incredibly long time while other objects that aren't necessary are being loaded behind them. So our general approach for solving these two causes, and by extension the problem, is to divide up the binary and to begin prioritizing the objects and their associated textures by whether or not they are in view. So to go into more detail, the way that your typical WebGL and WebXR scene is loaded is you have a large, you first request the GLTF file and then the GLTF begins requesting the binary and the image is in arbitrary order. So for example, we have a scene here where we have the satellite object that is in view and the ground object, which is the rocks and grass around the user that they can't actually see because it's behind them. So both of these objects are have their geometry data stored in one binary file, so at time equals one, that gets requested first. It's a very large file, it takes a long time to download. Then, because the texture fetching is arbitrary in order, the rock texture for the ground object gets downloaded, and then the moss texture for the ground object. And now we have all of the dependencies for the ground object downloaded, we can begin rendering it, but the issue is the user isn't looking at them. So this doesn't uh, help us make a correct image any faster than downloading things arbitrarily. The satellite object then is fetched, but much later, so the initial view that you look at is completely incorrect. Uh, our approach starts with splitting up this gigantic binary file into much smaller ones, one for each object. The satellite object is in view and is prioritized, so the binary for the geometry of the satellite object is downloaded first at time equals one, and then the texture for that satellite object is uh, fetched without downloading any further geometry data for other objects. At this point, we can begin rendering the satellite object, which is in view, giving the viewer a much faster uh, correct view. We can then go about downloading the binary and the images for all the other objects that are not yet in view, in case we need them later. So the splitting of the binary is relatively self-explanatory. You figure out what byte ranges correspond to what objects, partition that into many binaries, maybe do a little bit extra uh, to make sure that the byte alignment is maintained, but otherwise it's relatively straightforward. The more complicated part is prioritizing these objects based on the initial view, and we had to come up with several heuristics in order to make sure that the prioritization of these, uh, the download order of the objects was correct. So the first heuristic we could come up with was a simple view frustum calling. We 
parse through all of the objects, come up with access aligned bounding boxes that cover those objects, and quickly get rid of all the objects that do not intersect with the view frustum. That way we make sure that we never prioritize downloading an object that can't be in view. The second heuristic that we came up with was when we had the idea of, well, if we download all the objects that are in view first, that's great, but what about all the objects that aren't in view yet? Which one should we prioritize over others? And the general idea behind the second heuristic was objects that are closer to the center of the field of view are more likely to become visible than the ones that are further away. So we assign a simple look at rotation penalty. How far would a user wearing a headset need to move their head in order to see the object that's out of view and penalize it based on how large that rotation is? We then combine these two heuristics into a final score and use that to sort the object requests. So the general overview of VIA uh, can be broken up into two main components, an object scoring component and a partitioning component. The object scoring component will take as input the scene metadata file or the .gltf file and the user's initial positions and orientation for their first view. We will take the metadata file and come up with the access align bounding boxes by parsing that. We will then perform the rotation and view frustum calling scoring algorithms using the initial position and orientation of the user, combine those two to get our final heuristic. The second component of VIA is uh, the data buffer grouping or binary partitioning, where we take in the same metadata file, but also the binary uh, file containing all the data buffers and begin grouping them based on what meshes correspond to what parts of the binary, and then split them and come up with new metadata files and new binary files. All these are output in order of the object scoring. So the typical output looks like a large amount of GLTF and binary files that are sorted in order that they would be downloaded uh, off the server when the client connects. We're going to now go forward for a quick demo. Okay, so for this demo, we have WebXR running in Google Chrome. I am on a wired connection, but I am throttling the network to about 50 megabits per second, which is way faster than most mobile networks, but for the sake of time, we do need these things to load in a reasonable time for the presentation. All right, so we're going to quickly load a control scene just to show how this typically works. I do have the network log on the right side. So this is an indoor house scene the skybox and the javascript and the gltf load first we are now loading all the geometry data and as soon as it's done it all appears at once it takes many seconds for this geometry data to be downloaded and by the time it has been downloaded all the images have been downloaded and everything can just immediately uh, render but it does take many many seconds for all of this downloading to occur now if we run the via adjusted version of the same scene we see that the floor and the bed and the sink immediately appear. The walls load in a little bit later, and now we're continuing to load in all the other scenes that are all the other rooms that are not currently visible, but this room and all the objects visible were loaded far faster than the control. So now we're going to move on to the experiments that we designed in order to evaluate VIA and the results of those experiments. So we had five different test scenes that we selected for varying sizes, and not just varying sizes, but ratios of what types of data within that size. So some scenes where the geometry data was incredibly large and the images were small, and some where that was flipped, uh, and some where they were about the same size. We also chose scenes that had similar spatial uh, arrangements and not similar spatial arrangements. So uh, some that were completely enclosed, some that were open, some that were urban areas, some much more chaotic, and some without floors like a solar system. All five of these test cases, we ran through all three of the uh, systems. So we have the control where there are no changes to the binary, no change to the GLTF, no change to the images. The order is whatever the arbitrary order we got it from. Then we have VIA, where we split up the binary and we prioritize the images in the object ordering in order to see if it will go faster. 
and then we have via image which if you recall via has two components via image is simply via but without the binary splitting component so we just reorder the images based on visibility and we leave the binary as its original monolith we take all of these test cases and we run them on three different network bandwidths and round trip times that are covering typical mobile network conditions our main finding was uh, that VIA strictly has lower latency, that is the time from the point at which the page loads to what the first frame that is correctly rendered. VIA always has strictly lower time than the control. This time is even further better on slower networks. Very occasionally VIA image will have about the same benefits as via but most of the time it performs about the same as the control because both via image and the control require the entire monolithic binary to be downloaded before anything can be rendered so when we looked at the different network conditions we discovered that via was performance over the control does depend slightly on network uh, conditions typically the slower and worse your connection the better via will perform when compared to the control uh, the only trade-off really for VIA is that VIA introduces extra round-trip times for resource requests. Uh, if you have one gigantic binary file in order to download all of the geometry, you only have to send one round-trip time request in order to get that file to start downloading. But if you split it up into like 400 files, you now have 400 round-trip times that you need to account for. Typically this is an incredibly short amount of time, measured in milliseconds. So on slow connections, it's almost always worth it to split up the binary. The main variable that will change how well VIA performs over the control is what initial view you choose within the scene. We ran an experiment on one of the test scenes on one of the network conditions to see how a different view would affect the latency and found that it's incredibly important. Uh, we ran an uh, initial view where only a tree, its leaves, and the ground immediately surrounding the tree was visible within the initial view. So we had to download three objects out of 423 and had incredibly faster results than the control. We also ran an experiment where every single object was visible and saw that the latency was about the same, which is what we expected. Uh, Somewhere in the middle, you get middling results, of course. Uh, one of the main things that occurs when you're wearing a headset and you're loading into these images is that you have a camera that's attached to your head and it takes some time for the scene to download. So by the time that the scene is done downloading, your head may have shifted, you have shifted your weight, moved, tilted your head to the side, and the initial view estimate that the download started with may be different from the initial view after it's done downloading. So we ran an experiment to see how well VIA performs if the initial view is slightly off from where we expected it to be. Uh, just simply rotating the user's head in 15 degree increments and measuring the change in latency, we discovered that VIA continues to outperform the control until you look more than 90 degrees away from the initial orientation at which point VIA begins penalizing uh, objects more than the control would. Uh, so as long as the user is looking generally in the direction they were originally, VIA continues to outperform. So I'd like to thank you for attending this talk once again and ask for any questions. Thank you, Carter. Uh, again, I, I remind people they can answer or ask questions in, in the, the chats available in Whova or uh, Ace. Carter, I, I don't, let's see. I, I will start with a question. Um, and I, you, you mentioned uh, forming a, a, in your analysis, the view aligned view aligned limiting box or bounding box, perhaps? Uh, is my mic working? Uh, it's just okay. an axis aligned bounding box. It's okay. The... And I, I, it, I, I may have missed it, but does that require, is, is that in the metadata already mm -hmm. or does that require analysis of the, of the 
the points of, of the bin file. Yeah, I was surprised that it's in the metadata file. It's um, okay. the extremes for all the vertices are contained okay. within the metadata file. Okay, so then, then that leads them to my follow up and it's kind of speculative and maybe you thought of it, maybe not. If you had your, uh, if, if, if you could adjust GLTF or some other standards metadata, is there any other geometric information that would be compact, appropriate for metadata, but would be useful to have in the metadata so you can quickly use it in this type of optimization? Hmm. If I was going to change anything about the GLTF format, it would be some way to specify what order you would fetch these objects in. Um, but having additional information, it's kind of difficult because the only thing that uh, we had problems with was animations. Maybe you have an object that starts on one part of the right. scene, but it comes into view and we can't figure that out just from metadata information. Um, but that's sort of a niche case. Well I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about because you did you did the an other analysis where uh, you, you analyze how far you would have to row or what, what things are just sort of maybe just out of view that someone would only turn a little bit to see. Uh, is, is, you know, I, I'm trying to think if there's some other quick, you know, anything else that, that the 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 content author could put in metadata that would help that kind of uh, analysis. Maybe some sort of standard for uh, initial viewpoint, um, because that's implement that's renderer dependent. Um, web web uh, WebGL defaults to zero 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 and looking down the z axis. Okay. Uh, and then you can specify an object, but you can call it camera. You can call it initial camera. You can call it initial view. So it's difficult to parse in. So we just have it as a you know command line argument. Right. Okay, I, I note that there's been another question submitted to chat and it's similar to one I was about to ask. Uh, so this is from the Visual Computer Lab. And I, can the can the I'll, 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 can the person authoring the scene add an additional level of weighting for the importance of the geometry? Mm -hmm. Not in not in any 3D modeling software and not in any, you know, GLTF generator that I'm aware of. Uh, that would be nice. What you can yeah. <laughs> do is go in after you've generated all of these, you know, you split up the binary files and the GLTFs and the images. You can go in and just change their names because the way the renderer works right now is it just says, so for example, you take the Sponza scene and you have, you know, 300 objects. They're just labeled Sponza 0 to 300 and you just swap out the order manually you could do that but if you wanted to you know add a plug-in to say blender that allows you to like check mark something say always down this first that would be useful uh, well the variation that i was thinking of and this is important in computer aid design models is, is sometimes you have a model where they you know there'd be a large assembly and they have a separate mesh for every bolt nut and bolt hmm. very often the person looking at it doesn't really care about the nuts and bolts can you do you think in your work uh, you have those bounding boxes have you ever thought of just omitting things which are small fully contained within another bounding box Inside or just geometrically? I mean, you you you, oh, just you too, made, too small to be significant mm. to be seen. Okay. And you mentioned the satellite dish. You know, I don't know how to what level those are rendered this, in the VR scene, but you know, if 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 they've rendered in their GLTF all the little cables and things that go to a satellite dish, but right. if you're across the street, you know, <laughs> you don't see it. <laughs> Right. I don't believe we had any objects that small in our test cases, except for me. there was a shack scene that had um, small, uh, like half rendered uh, soda cans just in the yeah. background <laughs> that weren't necessarily visible. Um, so there could be some analysis on, OK, how expensive data wise is this object to render and how how much of a view for us does it take up? Right. So there's there's room for extra heuristics and all of these other things that you can extend the technique with. Okay, uh, let me again ask any. Do we do have perhaps a few minutes? Uh, 
there's any other comments or, or additional discussion people would like to have and uh, let's see. Okay, thank, thank you, Carol. Uh, if, Carl, I don't know whether you can see the question from Carol McDonald. She's asking about, could you zoom into smaller objects, which is a little bit related to the, the discussion we just had about. Mm -hmm. Well, if you could, uh, I, I, I struggled to think of a, a practical, a real world case where you would have your initial view be completely zoomed in on one object. Um, Although after everything's loaded, you could definitely you know move your headset really really close to some right. very small virtual object. Um, this project only cares about the initial view, the initial load time. So you definitely wouldn't want to completely omit those smaller objects, but maybe you would penalize them to later because you know the initial view doesn't focus on them too much. Carol says that works. <laughs> okay, well, th 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 thank you, Carter, for answering our question and for the interesting talk. I, 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 I think that it's appropriate to, to wait until the scheduled time. And it's, it's about four or five minutes away. Uh, for the final talk, just, just so anyone who particularly wants to start see that entire presentation. So uh, we, I, I guess we'll call this a few minutes break to refill your coffee cups or whatever you're drinking. Uh, and uh, Carter is available and uh, Dr. Paulus from the previous talk and Rick. So we have a few minutes to catch up with uh, questions, uh, maybe perhaps on the previous presentations and then at a uh, in about five minutes, we'll start with our our our, uh, our final paper from the session. Nicholas, if you're if you're still there, I know you're muted and not visible. But uh, since we have a few minutes, I, I wanted to uh, bring up a, and again a, a great question that Carol asked about. Uh, well, she asked in the sense of putting one of your sensors on a, on a migrating sheep, I believe. Uh, <laughs> that, that that kind of uh, brings the idea of, of bringing dynamism into your into your classroom. Uh, that kind of dynamic. Uh, virtual reality. Is that something you've, you've thought about the possibilities? Maybe, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks Vince. Yeah, we've, um, well, it's been kind of a mixed bag, um, you know, in terms of the the animations of the for the photospheres themselves that we've tried some time lapse approaches right which is sort of like uh like you would imagine a time lapse imagery um some of the things that we have been animating are for example down on our stream uh lab looking at the different um, rain gauges and flood gauges and stuff. So we are able to actually animate, you know, for example, the water level of the river based on what it actually was on that date uh, or for a certain flood event. But uh, it's been pretty simplistic, I have to admit, uh, to this point. So it's a good suggestion. Right. And the, the other thing, uh, we should, this is kind of off topic from the plenty, perhaps a little bit, but uh, in the archeology span session we had yesterday, the topic came up was 
these VRs also give you the ability to go places where your presence would da- if you actually bought a class to a you know a natural site mm. they they would damage it is that something which is a factor in your you know in the kind of work you're doing that's a great uh, point we haven't really come across that in our experience uh, so much yet there are um a few locations that we do have to sort of keep secret. For example, there are um, a ginseng hunters, for example, that will go around and, uh, you know, take um, plants from the national forest or whatever. So there are certain plots where we actually um, obfuscate the GIS data oh. so that people can't find them. That's a good, interesting scenario. Well, I, 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 I think about there, there, there are places in our national park system which have a very strict, uh, if you bought it in, you have to bring it out. And that includes everything. Uh, so I, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of hard with a, a bunch of grad students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. There was a, um, we have done a deer hunting game uh, on one of our properties, which is paper a few years ago. Um, it was about level of detail for trees and how we can do picking uh, oh. through these different kinds of models. So not too far off about the, the bear hunting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I think it's about time to, uh, to move on to the, the, the fourth paper of our session. And this is this was also at least partially the topic of a tutorial, a very interesting tutorial earlier in the conference. So the title for this paper is X3D Audiograph for the Consistent Declarative Representation of the W3C Audio API. So if I can ask if we can start that recording. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is a presentation about uh, the short paper X3D audio graph for the consistent declarative representation of the W3C audio API. First of all, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Eftihia Laka. My background is computer science and uh, I am a PhD candidate in the University of South Wales in the uh, UK. In this presentation, first, uh, I'm going to provide uh, the basic concept of spatial sound propagation for the design of a 3D virtual environment and highlight the motivation of this work. Uh, then uh, I will share with you the, the overview of the method and the idea behind uh, analyzing a specific developed example. I will focus on the audiograph concept and why it is useful to be used and some implementation expectation uh, I will end with the conclusion and with the strong points of uh, this work. Let's start uh, with a first glance, uh, what is spatial sound? Uh, for several years, great effort has been devoted to achieve high quality visual rendering for the development of interactive virtual worlds. Considerable attention has been paid to engage multiple senses in uh, 3D applications. So the researchers understood that a vital factor to improve the immersion and uh, realism for the user experience in a 3D environment, both visual and auditory rendering is needed. So as a result, the attribute of uh, special sound propagation for the design of a 3D visual environment has needed to be undertaken. And beyond that, uh, there are similar efforts in uh, web 3D applications uh, with uh, contribution of the immersive uh, audio. Therefore, if we need to give a definition of uh, special sound, we can highlight uh, this one. The listener can uh, recognize uh, meaningful spatial cues from a sound source, for example, the direction, the distance, uh, the spaciousness. It recommends a procedure in order to define the audio flow from scene source of an, an audio file to its destination of an speakers through sound effects and generally mimics the sound in the real world and provides uh, a more realistic and immersive uh, auditory environment. Motiv motivated by the above, uh, this work aims to integrating acoustic properties associated with uh, geometric shapes together 
with uh, 3D spatial sound in the ver in version 4 of X3D. Focus on uh, representing the sound process and activation profile model providing a rich audio graphic description in X3D. And to be more specific, uh, this solution is designed uh, in which the specification of X3D nodes are harmonized with the corresponding web audio API nodes, taking the advantage uh, of the representation of audio nodes uh, routing graph uh, structure. Before continuing with the main idea of this paper, it's uh, worthwhile mentioning that uh, this proposed solution is the result that is coming from uh, our systematic work and different publications until, until now. Namely, we introduced the first approach of special sound components in X Extreme framework based on the current uh, XD specification and web audio API in 2015. In 2018, we tried to have a systematic survey in order to understand and clarify the background and the most relevant algorithms for spatial sound in the literature. A year later, uh, we tried to go deeper and research the acoustic properties of the sound. In uh, 2020, we suggest a structure of a new node in order to extend the X3D specification harmonizing with web audio API both with special, attribute, special sound attributes and uh, with uh, physical effects which are involved in sound propagation. Uh, after that, uh, this proposal was accepted for the extension of X3D4 and now in this work uh, we aim to determine the best way to connect uh, X3D nodes making up uh, an audio graph at the same time create creating a large set of example audiographs that capture the full richness of a web audio API, revealing whether remaining design issues are resolved satisfactorily. In the next slides, I'll try to give an overview of the method. <clears throat> the, first of all, the audiograph model that we proposed. Uh, as I mentioned, the main purpose of this work is to harmonize X3D language that is used to represent 3D content in existing adaptive high-level API for processing and synthesizing uh, audio in web applications, of course. Web audio API is essentially a graph of nodes that process the signal. Thus, uh, if we could turn this graph into a visual XML-like uh, tree, it will be easier uh, to understand, uh, manipulate and reuse it through an XTD scene. How this uh, has been achieved? by the introduction of native uh, XD components with a few lines of code uh, that are explored. Next slide, XD uses a scene graph to assemble all the nodes that make up the virtual environment being modeled. The scene graph is a tree structure that collects all aspects of uh, 3D scene in a hierarchical fashion, properly organizing geometry, appearance, animation and event routing. In the same way, the proposed X3D audio graph consists of uh, the corresponding syntax that offers features for configuring a hierarchical structure audio graph with any number of uh, connected audio nodes. All the above will be more clear uh, with the next X3D example and uh, its explanation. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, explain a little bit more in order to verify the validity of our design and proposal. Uh, the new register node in X3D and uh, the proposed structure uh, were applied to several ex examples uh, that uh, were already implemented. Uh, one of them is depicted in this uh, slide. We use uh, x 3 to create 3D scenes and animations through X HTML. So in the following example, there are two sound sources in different positions. Through the immersion in the X3D scene, the user could uh, attend a rational uh, navigation. Whenever the camera moves in the direction of an existing sound source, the strength of uh, this uh, source increases, while the sound strength of the other decreases and uh, vice versa. So this is the example, the idea of the first example. Uh, can be represented in XRD code that you can see in the left side uh, of this slide. And to the right, you can see the corresponding hierarchical connectivity of nodes and the resulting audiograph, let's say. This means that the audio nodes in an XD model can be declared using XML nested elements where the parent-child relationships represent the connection between nodes in the audio graph. The structure starts with a topmost audio element for its independent audio graph. 
The inputs uh, uh, to each node are provided by each children and similarly the outputs of each node are provided to each parent. Uh, let's continue. So we can we have uh, the audio destination node first of all as the parent element of any other audio node. It represents the final destination of an audio signal and is what the user can ultimately hear. And uh, in the graph is, is this uh, la the last uh, is this last node. Accordingly. Uh, there are two sources that are passed through separate special sound nodes, one of the most important nodes in X3D, for the specialization of the input audio. For each source, a K node is used uh, to amplify or deamplify the input signal, and an audio clip uh, for emitting audio data. So this technique. Uh, is uh, structurally consistent with a corresponding here it is uh, corresponding web audio, web audio API source code as you can see in the bottom right graph which is uh, represent the nodes and the connection uh, in web audio API that are needed to implement the previous example that I have already described so which is the result the advantage of this uh, procedure understanding the tree form of X3D models is sufficient to utilize uh, the translated audio components and no further knowledge is needed regarding uh, JavaScript programming of uh, web audio framework. Consequently, users with uh, XD modeling background can use the, the proposed audio framework to develop and uh, integrate interactive uh, web 3D scenes, including immersive spatial sound. I will continue with some impl implementation expectations. The first one uh, for acoustic properties, besides the previous proposed solution that I have already described, the registration of, of new nodes, which include physical effects, uh, has been already proposed. Particularly, acoustic properties have been introduced that are involved in sound propagation, such as uh, surface reflection, specular diffusion, and the wave phenomena like refraction and diffraction. Uh, by taking, of course, take, taking into account the geometry of the scene, increasing the perceived uh, audio fidelity of uh, virtual scenes acoustics. In this figure, you can see and uh, the explanation of uh, this uh, definition: specular diffusion, uh, refraction, diffraction phenomena. Our initial implementation focused on the prediction of uh, reverberation time in enclosed spaces using simple uh, numerical solution, which provide a simple acoustic model, but retains uh, the essential acoustical properties of uh, the room as uh, accurately as possible. Uh, such uh, geometric simplifications uh, can often reduce computational uh, costs significantly without a reduction in perceived uh, audio fidelity of the in acoustics. Specifically, the idea is to uh, simulate real-time uh, ray tracing uh, model uh, that takes into account the interaction of sources, listener and the virtual environment in a 3D scene. Some of these interactions include absorption by air molecules, air attenuation, uh, and uh, by the surface in the virtual environment, like material absorption, specular or diffuse reflections, diffraction uh, and transmission through surface, etc. Our next implementation will emphasize materials of surfaces for the sound propagation, which are described by absorption and scattering coefficients in different frequency bands in this uh, time. The evaluation of the algorithm will be uh, by experiments using real, real rooms with the same sound, uh, let's say, characteristics and geometry in order to investigate and compare the results of the algorithm with uh, real audio measurements. A further interesting approach uh, is to create an application that has the potential of becoming an authoring tool for theater directors. Uh, actually giving them the ability to produce uh, the theatrical performance while offering uh, real-time control over the sound and visuals of uh, each scene. Namely, the, the application, the idea is primarily concerned with sound specialization and uh, multi-user connections combining Web Audio API, again, and X34. Uh, the, the WebRTC technology is used to create pair connections and exchange audio, video, and uh, binary data. The selective forward unit of WebRTC architecture allows multiple people to connect together, either as performers or spectators. 
uh, current work demonstrates uh, that streaming mechanisms can work through all uh, declarative and uh, imperative forms, uh, both acoustic properties and media streaming techniques, which, uh, which are proposed and uh, analyzed, prove that we provide a complete set of capabilities uh, for web audio processing matching uh, with the web audio app. The conclusion, as a final point, uh, XD4 graphics offers new exceptions, providing advanced 3D spatial sound propagation. The purpose of this work is to analyze and present the concept of the audiograph of oralization in a 3D scene, which is central to the composition of XD and uh, W3C web audio app recommendation. The valuation of specific examples proves that the uh, interactive virtual scene can be composed with the use of uh, XD register audio nodes and the results confirm uh, our methodology. Also, the implementation expectations are presented for more complicated uh, 3D scenes in, in order to achieve the expansion of the field of uh, immersive sound beyond the limits of uh, the no interactive approaches. So please, you can visit the below link uh, to have a look in our examples and, uh, and of course, more details uh, are presented in our tutorial of the conference with the title uh, Modeling Examples Extending Exit Realism with Audiographs and uh, 3D Spatial Sound. So this is the end of my presentation. Again, uh, I am Efti Alaka and uh, my email is available. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Aticia. Uh, for, oh, thank you, and for setting yeah. up your, your visualization. And I will ask, perhaps, if, if there's someone who has access to that PowerPoint, perhaps they could put that link in the chat. Since is, uh, yeah. oh, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? I, I have one which is very strictly a, a non-expert question. So uh, I'll give. Oh, thank you. It's in there. Uh, is there any? Okay, I will start things off. If you can quickly or say yes or no, I'm at the level where uh, sound, my knowledge starts at, at the difference between stereo and mono playback. Uh, <laughs> is the work you're doing, does it include stereo? That is, if you have a headset, seeing two different sound sources in the two different ears. Yeah. Uh, it does, OK. <laughs> Actually, if we see the, the first exams that we developed, uh, that's the, the, the first step for us to specialize the, the right and the left. Uh, oh, OK. So we have a, a, an audio source uh, moving uh, left and right, and uh, the, the user can uh, hear it from the corresponding uh, speaker. And so uh, the, other, the other, let's say, interactive uh, example that we developed is to to have a, a 3D scene, uh, a two sound source in this uh, example, and uh, uh, the user, uh, let's say, uh, flying in the, the scene. And uh, for us, uh, the camera is uh, in, the, in the ears of the user. Yes. And uh, when we go, go close to a, one sound, we can hear it. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the opposite when you go away. This is the idea. Of course, uh, uh, as, uh, we can, as you mentioned, we have a, a detailed uh, tutorial about this. Uh, we explain uh, which, uh, which is the now nodes of body app and uh, give a, a high level of the definitions, which uh, the new nodes, uh, audio and extra, and, and extra D and why we use, uh, why would we choose to, to harmonize with them. Uh, the idea, uh, but focus this uh, paper is to to explain the 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 how can we describe in X3D the, the the this this graph this audio graph how connect because the the make the one of the advantages in web audio app is this to uh, to to create your code but if you see all the nodes you can be like a, a graph a tree and uh, started with uh, from the audio buffer and uh, finalized to the to the destination. This uh, advantage try to to have it in extra dent. Of course, uh, any suggestion is it's, uh, it's, yeah. uh, it's welcome. Of course. Okay. Uh, Carter asks, and obviously he's thinking of his work about optimizing loading. And this may be perhaps an implementation question, but he, I'll, I'll ask you. He brings up the idea of, of asking whether these audio sources have to be loaded all beforehand in a similar way that his work discussed geometric resources. Uh, 
for these spe specific examples, what we do, uh, we use uh, the X3D. Uh, we use X3D for us because, we, as we see in the uh, presentation, it's a systematic work for us. So uh, we started the first uh, uh, demos, let's say, with X3D. So uh, this is, but it is not. Uh, uh, let's say we can use everything uh, language that you want for us x3d is standard web body app it is in a javascript but we can manipulate it in any uh, language that you want from us is x3 domain at, at, at the moment uh, does the mess with the sound propagation uh, and yes until the object uh, have loaded yes this is the the answer but uh, for try to, to be more, uh, let's say, more uh, uh, interactive uh, on this. <laughs> yeah, this is the, the idea. For, to clarify that the examples, maybe it's not so 3D, wow, et cetera, but uh, we try to, to use all the, the proposed nodes in order to identify that it's working. It's, uh, it's not only theoretical, but uh, we can use it in, uh, <laughs> in practice. And uh, if you if you have the opportunity to see the tutorial, we have another example from the our colleagues Maria that tried to have a, a platform uh, using WebRTC because WebBody API have has a different uh, nodes from WebRTC, WebRTC to input and for output. We introduced this in X3D, so we will try to have a, a, a platform uh, specifically for uh, the. Uh, the, the the guys that uh, try to to create a thea theatrical uh, area and uh, any performers any singers can be uh, linking from uh, his home uh, like this and uh, we have the, the final uh, uh, the final scene not uh, virtually this is the idea and uh, like uh, like zoom to 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 change data from the audio etc I mentioned that uh, we have proposed another node with uh, acoustic properties. Uh, this is the, the area that I try to, to focus on right now, uh, to have like, like uh, uh, some uh, reflections of the, of the, maybe of the, of the objects, so after that maybe from material, from walls. Uh, the first uh, initial development tried to have uh, uh, the the light uh, the light algorithms on this but have a better uh, have a better result uh, in a in a closed room let's say in 3d this is the idea yeah. and from my side uh, i believe that uh, we will try to have a solution not so uh, so so difficult for from uh, for uh, people that is not programmer uh, for that reason we we'll say that okay let's have the xml tree and uh, don't use anything uh, from JavaScript to create all right. this special sound. I don't know if somebody from uh, the co-authors uh, should uh, would like to, to add something. Uh, Don Bratzman and uh, uh, Richard is here, of course. Uh, they are helping me very much to to integrate and uh, to, to implement it and finalize the the extra D audio notes. Well, I don't say I'm looking at some of the questions and okay, we William has brought up the issue of temporal things and, and it makes me realize in our current X3D standard scene, we really don't have the concept of velocity of an object in our scene graph. And you know, in the in the oralization because the speed of sound is is much smaller than the speed of light uh the velocity of a source can actually uh, you know affect uh, the way it sounds to a, a stationary viewer is this something which is already included uh or is this to be a, a future enhancement to account for the doppler shift at the moment we borrow uh, the the specialization algorithms from uh, web body api and the functional so in this uh, the, the most uh, important things that we have, what is, we have the listener at the source right. and uh, a, a specific node uh, based on HRTF or another right. uh, additional uh, algorithms can uh, calculate uh, which, uh, which is the sound and how can we uh, render this. This is the, <laughs> for yeah. us at the moment, yeah. 
Okay. Of course, uh, in in uh, literature, we saw that uh, a lot of things from lighting can be in sound, but in very in in more uh, easy way uh, than uh, light. Let's say right. for that reason, try to have the the, the next uh, uh, development, and uh, maybe we can see, have a, I don't know the, the some uh, some algorithms from a light to be adapted for the sound. Uh, this is Dick. Uh, um, I thank you, Effie, for an excellent presentation. Uh, there are many opportunities for future work, including how do you adapt to different uh, transmission mediums. For instance, uh, sound underwater is a lot different than sound uh, through air. Uh, and, and I think this is all things that we can be working on. Uh, uh, in the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's very, it's a good and uh, we try to, to discuss about it and find the, the first step. Are there any further? I'm looking at the different chats. I, I do not see hands up or further questions. I see that, uh, I believe, from the visual computing lab, uh, uh, asking about collisions and scattering. Uh, that is a very complicated problem, I think. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps you can answer that in, in two minutes. Yeah, it is. Uh, the, the first uh, very uh, simple uh, algorithm to try to do uh, right here is to have the reverberation. Uh, uh, let's say, but uh, okay, for, for us, uh, it's uh, it's step by step to understand the physics, to understand the X3D, and after that, uh, include all of this. No, sorry, it was, uh, it came out uh, to, um, to, to convolute the, the, the question. I was just saying that uh, now when you, when you create an um, uh, interactive 3D app, a lot of time you have the, the geometry that you render uh, visually, and then you have to create also a very simple geometry that is used for navigation and collision with the wall or teleportation. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably if we want to go with uh, with spatial sound, you will have to go, uh, give yet another geometry as simple as this one that is used to compute this echo and uh, scattering mm -hmm. and occlusion also for sound. So more, even more work for uh, altering um, a 3D scene for interactive use it was just yeah. like a comment, you know, not, not <laughs> something that you needed yeah. to, to to add to your work. So, so that's try to do. It's a very simple, of course. Try to have some object in a 3D scene, have some material, and uh, when we have the sound here, we can use uh, which reflected, which uh, absorbed, etc. But okay, uh, step by step, <laughs> this one. <laughs> Because I should notice that all these uh, new nodes in X3D, it's after a lot, a lot, a lot of discussion because, okay, we have it like a, a pattern in the web of the app, but uh, after discussion, we find a lot of things that we should add it or change it, et cetera. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you to obviously all of our presenters, Effie, for the, very good presentation and for the tutorial earlier this week uh, and then all our presenters today and their other co-authors and colleagues who sat in and, and helped out with some of the questions. I know that we've already have some people arriving for the next geospatial summit so I invite everyone to stay for that uh, but for, for as presenter it's been a pleasure or as chair, it's been, a it's been a pleasure chairing this session for you all. And, and, and again, thank you for you and for the audience. So have a great day. Thank you.